I'm Lauren from Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., a Marvel Universe fan show, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other incredible geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. Hello and welcome to Capes on the Couch, where comics get counseling. I'm Anthony Sitko. And I'm Dr. Issues. We've got an interesting selection here for issue 163. President-level patron Matt has requested Gladiator. Not the Russell Crowe film, not the Daredevil foe, but the Praetor of the Shi'ar Imperial Guard and one of about 311 Superman analogs slash pastiches in Marvel. Because if you're going to rip off a character, you might as well rip off the best. Absolutely. Uh, quick reminder that as of the release date of this episode, you still have a couple more days to get in donations to my Extra Life fundraiser, which is growing steadily and appreciate every single person who has donated so far. I'll be live streaming myself playing games while riding a stationary bike. And the more you donate, the longer I have to ride. And in addition, as an added bonus, if any of our patrons donate to the fundraiser, I will match and double your donation. And if anyone joins our Patreon between now and December 18th, I will quintuple your pledge level as a donation. So I've already got a couple of folks that I have to match. Go ahead, join in. We'll have the links in the show notes. The money all goes towards Children's Specialized Hospital, 15 locations across North and Central New Jersey. They help thousands of kids every year. This is my 12th year being affiliated with Extra Life. And this is also the latest in the year that I've ever fundraised. It's just life kind of got away from me. But I was not going to give up the year without raising some much needed funds for the hospital. So get those donations in. And then at 10 a.m. on the 18th, I'll be live streaming on Twitch. And we'll have links to all of that as well in the show notes and on social media that you can watch me play games and turn my legs into jello. It's going to be a good time. And just in case anyone is really doubting Anthony, I've seen firsthand his dedication to doing these things. He really will do what he says. Oh, indeed I will. Oh, and I forgot to mention, if you donate $25 or more, I will bump up the resistance on the bike. So that that is for each donation of $25 or more, not like cumulative. So if it's not like if you donate $100, I'm going to bump it up four times. I'm <laughs> bumping it up once because I, I have to be reasonable here. I'm going to be riding. The goal is $1,000, which would equate to 50 miles, which is going to take me about three hours and change, give or take. I can't do that. And also ride with like a 30 level <laughs> on the resistance. It's just, it's not going to happen. Not unless I'm going to be you know, pulling myself up the stairs by my arms for the next week. Anyway, we are here to talk about Calark, a.k.a. Gladiator. <laughs> Gladiator of the Imperial Guard, created by Chris Claremont and Dave Cockrum in the X-Men 107, October 1977. He is introduced as a member of the Imperial Guard of the Shi'ar Empire, serving under Emperor Diken who is brother of the exiled Lalandra, who is an ally to the X-Men, on again, off again, paramour to Charles Xavier. Calark, whose name, by the way, is an amalgamation of Kal-El and Clark Kent to just really further drive home that whole Superman pastiche. Calark is a Strontian, and the race is incredibly strong, but only when devoted to a principle. Calark and other Strontians were vying for a spot in the Imperial Guard when they were ordered to return to Strontia and kill the Council of Elders. Kalak was the only one who obeyed without question, later learning that it was in fact a test of loyalty set up by the Elders to protect the homeworld because the Shi'ar Empire basically had a planetary gun aimed at the planet and said, 
either you give us your best representative for the Imperial Guard, or we're going to destroy the whole planet. And the way that they chose to do this was, again, through the test of loyalty. It's just, (laughs) we're going to get into that in the issues. Also, that origin story was not told until War of Kings in the mid-2000s. So we'll get into that again in a little bit. But that origin story and how he came to be Gladiator was not part of his history until much more recently. So as a member of the Imperial Guard and serving for the Shi'ar Empire, he encounters several heroes along his journey. I'm not going to go through the lengthy list of the encounters that he had with Spider-Man and Thor and the X-Men and et cetera, et cetera. He continued to serve whoever was in charge of the Shi'ar Empire, Deken, Lalandra, Deathbird, and then eventually Vulcan, who we just referenced last week when we were talking about Amora McTaggart and the whole situation behind how Vulcan was part of the first team to rescue the the original five X-Men and he was left for dead. Well, then he kind of went off into space and said, I'm going to destroy everybody and everything. He ended up taking over the Shi'ar Empire and Kalark serves under everybody who's in charge. He is loyal to the position, not the person. It's very much, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Let's just stick to the background. I, I'm kind of all over the place because I have a lot of things that I want to say about this, but I'm going to try and stick to the background. Apologies, folks. So Kalark defends the Empire against Vulcan and his assault, but when Vulcan leads a coup and takes over, Kalark is honor-bound to serve, although he does have fleeting thoughts of doubt. It's like, for a split second, it enters his mind. He's like, is this the best thing? But I'm here to serve the Empire, and so I serve the pleasure of Emperor Vulcan. On Vulcan's orders, Kalark and the Guard attack the wedding of Crystal and Ronan the Accuser. Go back and listen to our Crystal episode, hear a little bit about that. The wedding was intended to unite the Kree and the Inhumans. Although he sides with Lalandra to prevent her execution, he is unable to prevent a later assassination. This is the first time that we ever see Kalark question an order and say, this is wrong. I'm not going to obey this order that's given to me. I'm going to defend who I feel is the rightful head of the throne. And this all happens in War of Kings. A lot of this stuff is the War of Kings storyline and the cosmic era, the cosmic setting of Marvel. A lot of stuff is Abnett and Lanning. And I told Matt on Discord, I sent him a message. I said, I have not read the DNA cosmic stuff nearly as much as I feel I should have until researching for this episode. And I really feel like I've been missing out on because there's good stuff in here. Annihilation, et cetera, et cetera. So he ends up accepting the position of emperor of the Shi'ar to prevent further bloodshed and war but he does appoint two advisors to help him handle most of the logistics of running the empire because it's a situation where he's very much, I'm not really the guy who should be running things. I'm just kind of the the soldier. It's like when Optimus Prime is handing the uh, <laughs> matrix of leadership to Ultra Magnus hmm. and he's like, I, I'm just a soldier, Prime. I'm, I'm not fit to lead. He's like, you will light our darkest hour. And then he turns to gray and then every child of the 80s sobs because their hero has passed away. Anyway, so he joins the Annihilators to give himself an outlet for fighting because he doesn't care for running the empire. He wants to go out there and fight. This is who he is. But he refuses a leadership role within the Annihilators. We see a pattern here. He joins the Galactic Council where he decides that Earth must be destroyed to save the universe from incursions, but when it was restored, no memory remained of the destruction or the decisions that led to this. This is part of Secret Wars and the kind of ending of the Ultimate Universe and and the a soft reboot of some of the Marvel stuff. He put a time-displaced Jean Grey on trial for her future crimes as Phoenix, and I did actually read this part because I was reading the Guardians of the Galaxy book at that time, and this is the trial of Jean Grey when the time-displaced X-Men, original X-Men, are brought forward in time by Beast, who says, I'm going to take the five original teenagers and bring them to the present, and then maybe if they see how messed up stuff is, when I send them back, they'll make it right. That's not how this works, Hank, but I digress. So after Xandra is discovered, who is a egg 
created from the genetic material of Xavier and Lalandra. And the egg was discovered, by the way, by Rogue and Gambit on their honeymoon. And you can go back and listen to the Rogue and Gambit episodes as we discuss that marriage. More specifically, the Gambit episode, I think, is where, where we yeah, discuss definitely. the honeymoon stuff. But that's what happens is they go on their honeymoon and they find the egg and they're like, oh, gosh, this is this is bad. This should not be here. So after Xandra is discovered, Kalark hands over the throne of the Shi'ar Empire to her and returns to his role as head of the guard because he says, you are the rightful heir to the throne because your mother was the only halfway decent ruler the Shi'ar Empire has ever had. And you're her daughter, even though you've only been alive for a couple of weeks, probably. And she's been like aged up and it's a whole thing. She has the mind of a child, but he's, and Matt does reference that. And then it's like, oh, good. Someone here, take the, take this off my plate. I'm going to go back to fighting. We good? Thanks. So again, I glossed over a lot of stuff, but anyway, let's dive into the issues. And since Matt picked this episode, he has delivered us a lovely write-up. So the first one, the waxing and waning of his self-esteem and focus. It's a function of the Strontian species that their physical abilities are all directly tied to their confidence level and their belief in themselves and their purpose. When Gladiator believes he can do so, he is powerful enough to knock planets out of their orbit, burn Galactus with his heat vision, and is said to have once ripped a black hole in half, which I really hope was just an idle boast because there's just so many things wrong with that sentence. When he doubts himself, he becomes weak enough to get smacked around by Cannonball. All right. So when we were first discussing this episode, I remember saying to Anthony, very simple sports analogy, he's a front runner. And some of you may want to know what that means because you're not into sports and I don't mean to alienate anyone. If you have a team or a, an athlete in a competition that does really well as long as they're ahead, as long as they're in the lead, in the front, if you will, it's almost impossible to beat them. But then heaven forbid someone challenges them, gives them competition where the outcome is in doubt, then there's a much greater chance, as a matter of fact, a chance greater than what would be expected by randomness for them to lose. And so that's the definition of front running. But the psychological component to that is something that has been studied for a long, long time. And I don't mean to make it all about sports, but that was the first thing that came to my mind. The idea is more that what happens in circumstances where you are unsure of yourself. How does that mold your response? And this has been a philosophical debate well before anybody listening to this podcast was bored. It's centuries old, where there are some people that point out adversity doesn't really make a person's character, it reveals it. I'm, I'm not so sure that's always the case. There's also the idea, though, that you have the opportunity to change your own ability to cope with stress by being exposed to more stress. And there's a lot of evidence for this ever since World War I and World War II when studies were being done about PTSD. And they didn't call it PTSD at that time. You know, there's always a term shell shock. There was a military sick syndrome, whatever. The thing that they noticed was in order for the unit itself to do the best it could, when someone was exposed to an obvious trauma, Rather than the person being completely taken out of the field, out of the battle, sent home and never to return again, the best results were when people were given immediate feedback, full discussion of what was happening. Yes, brought away from the event itself, but allowed to process parts of what had happened so that they could return to some of their duties, even if it wasn't full active duty. And they notice that people seem to handle that better rather than just completely shutting out and isolating. Gladiator clearly likes to fight, clearly likes competition, clearly likes the idea of the camaraderie of being with other soldiers. And yet part of what happens is there's a loss of control. If he's winning, he's dictating what's happening. 
But heaven forbid there's something else that just doesn't quite go his way. Now, there's a sense of questioning of not just what are my abilities, but who am I as a person? When you identify with something so strongly that there's nothing else to fill in those gaps when other things go wrong, then it can all fall apart. And that can lead to a lot of emotional turmoil. And that's pretty much what we're seeing here. So it's not just soldiers. I know that's what I'm, I'm talking about most. It's not just sports. This can be anybody's job, a career. It could be their role in the family. It can be anything in your life where you, for whatever reason, have placed yourself at a certain level, a certain pedestal. And as long as no one challenges that, you're fine. But if any sense of doubt, anything creeps in, then that facade just falls away and you have nothing left to back it up. Yeah, it is always fascinating to me to see folks that seemed to be unstoppable, seemed to be at the top of their game, seemed to have all the confidence in the world. And it turns out to be a house of cards that crumbles at the slightest breeze or the slightest push. Yeah, the the best quote. And ironically, it's a person that really epitomizes what we were just talking about. Mike Tyson, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. I think I just said that the last episode or two episodes ago. Yeah, you did. You did. And it's amazing how that just keeps coming up. But but I'm not doing it because of the quote. I'm doing it because Mike Tyson still has that quote unquote moniker, baddest man on the planet. The whole point was, When did he start losing? He didn't start losing necessarily because he wasn't capable of beating the best in the world. He started losing because when a huge underdog, Buster Douglas, challenged him, actually, he himself was considered to be kind of a soft touch and would wilt under the pressure and things. The one time he actually rises to the occasion, while someone like Tyson, who had other things going on in his life, I don't want to make it sound like just a one one note situation, but the point was the bully got bullied. And from there, things were never the same. So, yeah, that aura of invincibility. But I don't want to just make it about the physical. I'm saying that, you know, this is this is something that anyone can fall prey to. It's a matter of your sense of ego, your sense of of pride. If you are placing all of your chips in that one bet that this is the one thing in life that I am absolutely perfect at, I am fairly certain you're going to fail at some point. It's just inevitable that. If your entire persona and if your entire internal code is built on that, that you need everything lined up exactly right in order for that to happen, it will eventually run out. Something is going to happen. Something is going to come up that is going to knock down a domino. It doesn't have to be all of them at once, but it could be a domino, but it eventually tick, 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 tick. And then the whole thing comes crashing down. And I always like the stories where that happens and then it becomes a situation of what do they do now? Where do they go from here after they've fallen? That's one of the main reasons why one of my favorite Moon Knight stories is the bottom. It's literally about Moon Knight having everything taken from him and he's at the complete end of his rope. He's lost everything and every one. And what kind of hero is he from that point moving forward? So. Second issue, a slavish devotion to his sense of duty. Gladiator takes his oath of loyalty to the Shi'ar throne and his position as Praetor of the Imperial Guard very seriously. He begins his career of Imperial service when the Emperor orders him and the rest of the cadets being evaluated with him to kill the Council of Elders of his home planet as a test of loyalty. Most of the cadets refuse the order and rebel. Gladiator obeys it without question. He's had to serve a string of emperors and empresses who are open, who are objectively very bad people, from Takar to Deken to Deathbird to Vulcan. He hates the things he's ordered to do most of the time, but is a loyal servant of the throne through and through, purposely keeping his focus single-mindedly on his duty in order to keep his powers at their maximum level and best perform his duties. The only time he ever wavers is when he's ordered to execute Lalandra, which is a pretty high bar, all things considered. And this is what I was saying when I was going through the background, is... The comparison that I would make, and I don't know how many of you watched Game of Thrones consistently, but he's somewhere between a Sir Barristan Selmy and a Varys in the devotion to the throne, not necessarily the individual sitting on it. Barristan Selmy was head of the King's Guard, one of the best fighters in the Seven Kingdoms, and 
only when Joffrey took over was he basically kicked out and then he was like, oh, screw you. Um, I'm coming back for, for all of you. Varys, meanwhile, was the spy master who famously told Ned Stark in season one, I serve the seven kingdoms or I serve the realm or I serve the throne, whatever the expression was that he used, meaning that his position was not to support any one person on the throne, but rather the notion of the title. And we see that a lot. I've heard this, I don't know how many times over the past 20 years, respect to the office of president, regardless of who's sitting in the Oval Office. But I'll pause the rest of my thoughts until Doc has a chance to chime in. So this is a psychological cheat code. Many people in their lives are going to go through multiple iterations about their purpose. What is the thing that gets them up in the morning? What is the thing that is going to allow them to feel a sense of fulfillment? And what is the thing that if they're on their deathbed, they can say, this was a life well lived? Someone like Gladiator doesn't have that. The consistency of knowing that you have made a decision for yourself that will give you the initial motivation for success for something that you've placed at a high priority, that you do it very well, that other people can understand. So you don't truly, unless someone wants to dig, you don't really have to explain yourself. You don't have to expend the emotional or intellectual energy to say why you are serving the throne. That's not really a bad gig when you think about it, at least superficially. And it makes the shortcuts of decision making a lot easier. If anyone's ever heard the term decision fatigue, why does that happen? It doesn't happen because we prioritize what decisions are more important than others. It happens because using your mental energy each day to pick and choose certain things over the course of a full 24 hour period is exhausting. So anything you can do to minimize the actual number of decisions you make can allow for a greater opportunity to rest. So even though physically he's doing a lot, and I'm not saying he's stupid, but I'm saying the other types of psychological challenges that you have when you struggle with these things on a regular basis gets completely ignored. So what's the problem? Why would that be an issue? Yes, we know, we see it on the outside. If you are doing things that lead to a negative conclusion in society, because someone is giving you orders to do that bad thing, yes, there is a problem. But Gladiator's response in theory can be, it's not my problem. And as horrific as that may sound, it leads to less stress. It leads to the ability to disregard and and really compartmentalize a lot of things that could be traumatic events and just chalk it up to just following orders, which, as we know, can be a very dangerous thing as well. And yet, it means that, to tie it back into the first issue, it means that there's less of a chance for a few of those cracks in the armor to form, because most things are just going to slide off from the start. You're giving people less of an opportunity to challenge you, because they know that that's a weak front. They, they know it's, I shouldn't say weak front, it's a useless front. You're not going to change his mind about anything. And he makes it clear you're not going to change his mind about it. So no one else makes that attempt, even though in theory, the best thing that someone may be able to do would be to simply say, wow, I can't believe you are incredibly wrong about absolutely everything in your life. But then again, since when has that approach worked? Therapy doesn't work that way either. So really, it, it's... It's this interesting, incredibly hard, dense shell of emotional immaturity that can really go on indefinitely. Some people really do live their lives this way to the end. I'm not advocating it, but I am saying, in a way, I understand. Was that a Chris Rock reference? No, 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 but can't help it. Sometimes I sound like that. (laughs) Because it's just kind of how it came across. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they should have killed Lelandra, but I understand. No, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There were so many good points that you made there and things that I wanted to touch upon when you were done. 
And unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, I don't remember any of them. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a good point. I want to talk about that. Okay, let me let me hold until he's done because I don't want to interrupt. Oh, that's a good one too. Oh, okay. Yeah, I want to talk about that too because I have thoughts. Well, you're, I mean, you're the editor. You can do what you want and post. Eh, that's fine. <laughs> As I said to you when we were writing the skit, which you're going to love hearing shortly. Anything I would attempt to do would be adding a mustache to the Mona Lisa. But I do have thoughts about this next issue, so I will do my level best to remember. I was going to say, you know what? In this case, I know we don't usually do it this way. Maybe you should get them out first. I'm totally okay with that. Well, I did that a little bit with the second one. So the third issue then, lack of faith in his ability to lead anything that's not the guard. When Vulcan and Deathbird are dispatched after War of Kings, Gladiator really doesn't want to take charge of what's left of the Empire and would rather anyone else be leader besides him. When he's with the Annihilators, he has no interest in any kind of a leadership role, despite arguably being the team's most powerful member. But Professor X and Lalandra both die, and someone has the bright idea to hatch a child from an egg made out of their combined genetic material. Gladiator's first response is, oh, thank God you're here. You're the Empress now. This is probably tied to the confidence-based nature of his powers, but even with all of his experience serving at the highest echelons of an interstellar empire that boasts over one million member states, he really seems allergic to the idea of being in charge of anything that's not in his comfort zone of the Praetorian Guard. Now, I think that we can all identify, and I may be speculating a bit, but I think we can all identify with knowing your strong suits and acknowledging what you're not suited for which you may not have the personality for, which you may not have a physical skill set for, which you may not have a desire for. Gladiator takes all of that to an absolute extreme and says, I'm good at this one thing. I ain't going to try anything else. And I can at least on some level empathize with and understand that because I've definitely been there myself. But again, he kind of takes it to 11 with the whole, I don't want to do anything that is even remotely outside of my, my skill set. I'm a soldier. I'm only ever going to be a soldier. I only ever want to be a soldier. So there's that. And like I said, that ties into, again, the Ultra Magnus comparison that I made earlier. Now, whether or not Hot Rod was a better choice, I think the answer is no. But I mean, nobody's going to beat Optimus. But anyway, it, it, the floor is yours, Doc. So there are two things that come to mind. The first is imposter syndrome, which most people know doesn't fit as much only because it's not like he's usually in situations where people are just automatically pushing him into these spots and he's wondering if he's going to be figured out because that implies a person wants to be in that position, but is so worried about all the mistakes they may make. He doesn't want it at all. So it doesn't quite fit. There's something much more important to this. And while it may not fit his skill set, this idea, this topic that I'm about to introduce is definitely relevant for most people that interact with others in a work environment, the Peter principle. So what is that? The Peter principle, I'm just going to take it as a quote, an observation that the tendency in most organizational hierarchies, such as that of a corporation, for every employee to rise in the hierarchy through promotion until they reach a level of respective incompetence. So I'll take, honestly, my situation. And it doesn't mean my job. I'm saying I work for a hospital. Hospitals are full of doctors and nurses and other technicians and aides and all of the other people that help a hospital run. Everything from security to administrative assistants to the janitorial staff, everybody, okay? Each of those departments is going to have a department leader. I'll just pick it at random. Let's say you have the best x-ray technician. They are so quick. They know exactly where everything is. They get the reads done very quickly in terms of getting people to the machines. The radiologists love the fact that they don't even have to ask when it's going to be done. It's already there. All that stuff. Wonderful, wonderful at their job. They get a promotion to be assistant night supervisor to the technicians. This person hasn't taken a single managerial course. They didn't go to school for this. They would rather their shift end right on the dot because they have other things in their life. 
but it comes with a pay raise, so they do it. All of a sudden, people start to notice that this person is more irritable. They notice that they are not as motivated for the job because they just don't know some of the things that they don't understand. It's literally an unknown unknown. And they go to their own supervisor saying, I, I'm not sure what else I'm supposed to do. And depending on that supervisor's position, they may either feel threatened that this person is so good that they're going to take their job so they don't want to help. Or maybe they offer the help, but when they do, they notice that this person really doesn't want to be in the position at all. And so they're wondering, well, should I demote them? But they're a nice person. I don't want to do that. It just creates a lot of turmoil. And the whole point is, sometimes we focus so much on the idea that because someone is good, they need a certain accolade. They need a certain sense of praise. They need that reinforcement. Meanwhile, the only thing the other person wanted was to continue doing the thing that they were enjoying in the first place. Their own actions were the reinforcement. They weren't looking for the external stimulus. So if that's the case, we may be going about this all wrong. So with someone like Gladiator, who is in his lane, knows his lane, knows it really well, clearly has some issues about whether or not he ever is going to continue to do his lane as well as he thinks he does, because often if things aren't going perfectly, he still has some some foibles there. And you say to that person, okay, so you're going to take a step up. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, nah, nah, not happening. Not going to happen. Never going to happen. As a matter of fact, don't ask me. And if you do ask me again, I'm just going to quit. That's an exaggeration, of course. But is it really? There are some people that are willing to even find new jobs doing the exact same position rather than be escalated within their own company. And if you want reinforcement, you want stimulus, a lot of companies reward that because when they're headhunting, their point is, we just want the best in that zone. We're not looking for promotions right now. We just want someone to do that job really well. Oh, you'll do. So sometimes we really do get our incentives mixed up. And while, yes, that is a problem with Gladiator, and it is true that he's, he's shrinking from an opportunity, it may also be that he is so in tune with himself in that one aspect that everything else around him being forced all the time is just compounding it. He's going to double down on what he knows rather than branching out. And the more you try and push it, the more insular he gets. Yeah, I've definitely been in situations where I've been expected to do things that I have limited or no knowledge of because I'm good at this. Therefore, the assumption is that I must be good at these other related things. And I'm putting related in air quotes because, again, the assumption lies with someone else, but they never bothered to ask me if I'm good at it or if I'm comfortable with this responsibility. It's just, oh, yeah, you could do that. So you could do all these other things and tack on all these other additional responsibilities. That's one of the reasons why I'm looking for a different job now, because I I like what I do, but with all of this other associated nonsense that is thrust on my plate and has been for the past couple of years, I, I'm saying, no, this is not what I want to do. This is not what I signed up for, and I don't want to do this. And to the point, I'm actually glad you brought up the Peter Principle because I, I see it all the time. I absolutely see it all the time. I'm a government employee. It's just kind of how it goes. Oh, yeah, you're good at this. You're good at this. You're good at this. You're not so good anymore. But so you're not going to get promoted anymore. You're just going to stay there and be a stick in the spokes for everything else. And related is the, the Dilbert principle, which is, oh, you're horrible. We're going to bump you up to upper management so you get out of the way. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the whole political tactic, kick them upstairs when it came to certain appointed positions. That's been going on for a long time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Get them out of here so they can't do any damage. So we got some good stuff here and uh, we're going to take a break. We're going to plug some shows. When we get back, we'll get into treatment. Stay tuned. Hey, this is Ken M. Padawan J. Coach Duffy. From the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour podcast. Every week, the ODPH is talking sports, movies, TV, comics, and more. It's always a parlay of topics on each episode. You can find the ODPH on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, and wherever you find great podcasts, such as the one you're listening to right now. 
Don't forget to check out OchoGuruPowerHour.com where you can find the links to all of the ODPH social media accounts, links to the bands whose music you hear each week on the show, hashtag 607 podcast info, and parlay points, our companion block section of the show. Thanks for listening to the ODPH. Now get back to your regularly scheduled podcast. Hi there. We're so sorry to interrupt your regular podcast listening, but we just wanted to introduce ourselves. I'm Bonnie. And I'm Anna. And we're the hosts of Freudian Sips, a podcast about brains, beverages, and other BS. We are a mother and daughter who are both licensed counselors, and we like to get together every week or so so we can have a glass of wine and talk about whatever cool psychology things interest us and our listeners. So if you want to hear two slightly tipsy things, therapists chat about historical psychology theories and the people who made them, questionably ethical experiments, mental health and illnesses, and other fascinating stuff, then you should listen to us. So pour yourself a drink and tune into Freudian Sips on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Cheers. Hey, this is Cullen Bunn, and you're listening to Capes on the Couch. Hey, we're back. So treatment... I have the power indeed. Gladiator, in universe, what do you do with Calark? So I know we didn't say a theme per se for this, but I'm just saying this on the fly. More than you think you are. So in universe, I really, really, really need to see just what he does in a non sequitur situation. What do I mean by that? No fighting, no, no bureaucracy, like none of, none of that, you know, I need him away from, from all of those different things. I need him doing something that is so out of his comfort zone that he really does become as, as nondescript as anybody could be. Maybe that's a daycare center or something. I don't know. I mean, really just get him. Complete, like, I'm not even talking gradual. I'm talking shock. Like, just really put him in a situation that makes no sense to him and start from scratch. Because it's obvious that he has a lot of tools that apply across a lot of different situations, but he's never actually done it, never actually tried it. And as I already said, I don't think a person like that is going to allow themselves to be put in gradual situations, for example, for desensitization or optimization of, of behaviors or anything like that. I think this is one of those real cold shock kind of situations. You just throw them out into something else and let them have all the emotional outbursts, the tantrums, all of it. And ironically, it works even better because even if he does do something that's considered reckless or dangerous, it wouldn't be nearly as harmful because he'd be depowered in a way. So I think that's a that's a great idea. It's like an inverse of what you would expect with I'm not trying to, to be stereotypical about this. I'm not saying padded room. I'm not saying rubber room. I'm not saying anything like that. But honestly, a playground, like just something random that's like, what what on earth am I supposed to do with this? And that's the point. And see how we could we could actually interact that way. It'd almost be like dealing with a child in play therapy. You're not necessarily doing anything direct, but all of the interactions themselves just start to build on one another so that you develop an actual treatment plan. Get him completely out of his element, which naturally is going to have an impact on his confidence level because he's going to say, I don't know what to do here. There's no battle plan for this. I mean, he might just end up thinking that you're trying to trick him and punch a hole through your skull or zap you with eye lasers. In either case, it's not going to end well for you, but I don't know. That's an interesting concept. So out of universe then, is this a situation where you're just dealing with a high pressure athlete who maybe has the yips from time to time? That's fair. The idea that somehow other competitors have a clutch gene or whatever the the stereotype that the trope is, you know, all of that. And there are psychiatrists and, and psychologists that do work contractually through sports psychiatry with different organizations, different teams, different sports, or individual athletes in, in more individualistic sports. But that's something that I've been interested in a long time. Uh, but because of my own limitations of my personal uh, fallacies and, you know, 
horrible psyche. I, I never jumped into it the way I probably could have, but this isn't about me. The point is someone like that, yes, it's reaffirming all of the skills and all the things that they've developed over time. And a lot of it has to deal with desensitization. You have to have the person so comfortable with the idea that things are not going to go perfectly, that things are not going to go right and still be able to perform at a high level. And I actually don't even have to imagine the scenario and I'm going to reference a podcast. If anybody is familiar with ESPN 30 for 30, they also did some podcasts. And one of them is about something. Anthony, I don't know if you're going to remember this, but long time ago, Reebok did a series of commercials for the decathlon with Dan and Dave. Oh, yes. I remember Dan versus Dave. Yes. Well, it was 1992 Olympics. Yes. And most people at this point know the immediate part of the story where Dan did not make the Olympic team that year. He failed on the pole vault. I still remember the event. And in addition to that, Dave, I think he placed fourth or got bronze. I don't remember. I'll be honest with that. It's in it's all of this is in the podcast. But the part that nobody actually realizes is that after that failure, Dan was seeing a, a sports a psychologist and the psychologist had him watch the video of the failed pole vault repeatedly until he got desensitized to it. And then Dan went on to not only win the world championships two years later, he actually won the gold medal at the decathlon in Atlanta. So there's a happy ending to that, even though nobody really knows about it because people usually don't follow the decathlon that much. But the fact that that's a direct example, that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Because he even pointed out with the pole vault, he said some parts were very similar to his last failure before the, the previous Olympics. And he changed his tactic where he said, you know what? Last time I waited, waited, waited. He said, no, this time I wanted to get it out of my system. And I said, I'm going to do a lower jump first just to build my confidence a little bit. And people were surprised because I can usually make that easy. And he said, but that little boost was all he needed. He went on, did great. So I love the fact that sometimes you could just use real world examples of that with the person's permission, of course, and and show that using someone's previous experiences, even if they're considered traumatic, as long as it's done in a supervised and safe fashion can yield some amazing results, provided that the person is willing to do it. And that's exactly what you do with anything that's considered high pressure or something that you know has caused you problems in the past. You can make them into incredible strengths. And that's true for anything. The fact that we're doing this podcast, now I am going to be selfish. The fact that we're doing this podcast, I've said this in other episodes, but I haven't said it in a long time. I used to dread the idea of speaking like this. I used to absolutely fear, shake, tremble, all of it whenever I had to do something from third grade on. I couldn't stand it. Now I actually get invited to speaking engagements. I'm actually doing a radio bit with my actual you know, professional name and, and everything else tomorrow at the request of people. That's absurd. And the fact that I immediately just said, yep, no problem. I don't hesitate anymore. I don't think about it all because I remember saying to myself plenty of times like, there's got to be a reason why people are asking you to do this. So you, you might as well stop trying to shy away from it. And I enjoy the person that I became because of it. I enjoy the fact that even when I make plenty of mistakes or I notice things, most people don't. Or if they do, they point them out to me as quirks. Great. Cool. I love it. It's part of my personality. Wonderful. And I actually feel better about myself because of it. So please, anybody that has those things that they are shying away from or they're scared or or you're you're worried that the bad thing's going to happen again the worst case is then you that just means you have a story where you're going to learn from the experience twice it's all good please give yourself that chance take that opportunity cuz the worst that could happen is that you learn from it the best that can happen is it changes your life in immense ways that you never imagined yeah absolutely and i like how you pointed out that the worst thing that happens is you learn from it maybe twice because I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with. They accept that, okay, if I try something and I don't get it, all right, I'm going to learn from it. 
But what happens if you fail a second time? What happens if you fail a third time? How many people are willing to try that many times who are willing to face failure that many times and keep moving forward? How many people have the internal willpower to keep trying different things, take another swing at it? It's not an easy thing to do. And we've all been in a situation where we've failed twice. We fail once, we try again, we fail twice and we go, all right, that's it, I'm out. It's a very realistic thing to to keep trying repeatedly is a sign of incredible willpower or incredible stubbornness. It's very, very close. The other thing I wanted to point out is the idea that you were referencing. I, I forget if you were saying it was Dan or Dave. Starting with the small stuff that you know you can do and then work your way up for it. That you say, okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to attempt this large goal. I'm not going to go right for that because I'm probably not going to get it. But let me start with what I got. Let me start with what I know I can do, adjust my expectations, and build from there. And the problem that I, at least for me personally, the problem I have is if it's something that I was operating at a high level, or at least I I had a, a lot of confidence in for an extended period of time, and then I I take a break for a while. I come back to it. My expectation internally is that I'll be able to jump right back in where I was. How many of us have taken an extended break from exercising, from lifting weights, from running, whatever the case may be? You take a couple of weeks. Off. It doesn't even have to be a really long time. You could just take a couple of weeks off. Maybe life gets in the way. Maybe you got sick, whatever. You take a couple of weeks off. You go back to the gym. You're sucking wind. You used to be able to deadlift, I don't know, 150 pounds. Now you're struggling at 100. Used to be able to run a six and a half minute mile. Now you're gasping for air trying to run, you know, a nine minute mile because your body needs some time to readjust. But you can't go into it saying, oh, that's it. I'm a failure. It's okay. Circumstances changed. I have to adjust my expectations accordingly and acknowledge that a step backwards does not equate to failure. It is a step backwards. And if we can acknowledge that for what it is and not catastrophize it, that is ultimately going to help us create better mental resiliency moving forward. Because to be able to say, this is just a minor step back, this is just a, you know, a little thing, I can work with that. I was, I used to be here previously and I was able to get through it. So I feel that I can do it again. And that's what I think the reframe needs to be. I I was at this point and I was able to surpass it previously. I don't anticipate why I can't do that again. I think we all have those things in our life that require that kind of a reframe. And I think if we can put that spin on it, we will all be better off in the long run and in the short run, frankly, as well for that kind of resiliency. So with all of that being said, we are going to see what happens when we get CalArc Gladiator on Dr. Issues' couch. Hello, CalArc. I'm Dr. Issues. Thank you for taking the time to see me, Doctor. So what can I do for you? Well, forgive me my manners, but protocol would dictate that we should at least shake hands before discussing more personal items. Okay, sure. Yeah! yeah you have quite the grip for a human. Said... No one ever. Are you okay? I wasn't even trying to... I'm fine. Every, everything's fine. Not everything, but my hand is fine. Have I truly fallen so far? What was that? Nothing. I I need to see you because I have some questions that only a man of mental science can answer. Mental si- That's unique. Anywho, go ahead. Even though I am eons old, I pride myself on my stamina. Do you understand what I'm referencing. This is a bit embarrassing. Well, you might need a different specialist then. Do you have a primary care provider? The Shi'ar Empire has spared no expense to test me from crown to soul, and yet they find nothing. But I confess I have not provided all of my details. Go on. (sighs) Look, I'm a professional. This is all confidential. 
if this goes where I think it's going, I may have ways to assist you. So please continue. <sighs> I'm a proud member of the Imperial Guard. The proudest member, if you will. I train my body constantly to serve in as many capacities as I can. And yet, I must admit, I may have cheated. Oh, the shame. I'm not casting judgment. You cheated with whom? No, no, I, I do not blame anyone besides myself by my own hand. Well, your hands may desensitize you if you aren't using variation in technique. You do sound like you know about this topic quite well, and without hesitation. Fair enough, then. I will admit, I have resorted to using some natural remedies. Supplements, if you will. Oh, really? Well, on Earth, many of those products do more harm than good. I have learned the hard way that this is true throughout the galaxy. Yes, for a brief time, I felt like I could tackle a whole army and have my way with them in any test of accomplishment. But that feeling faded. Now I feel weaker than any Strontian has a right to feel. I may look the same, but I can tell I lack girth. Is, is any of this making sense? Yes, and, and I can definitely help you. There's plenty of literature on my planet that shows that some men have this type of adverse reaction to treatments for anxiety or depression. Really? So they can't get up what they used to? I could lift planets out of their natural orbit, you know. Not the visual I would have wanted, but my point is it's treatable. I don't know what the alien equivalent is, but here it's called sildenafil. You know, there's some other options, and yeah, I really need to go over the risks and benefits of... I have no fear of risks. Just tell me the benefits, please. Well, as you may have guessed, you'll be able to function in that area again. It increases blood flow, but the typical formulation is only used as needed to avoid staying that way permanently. What? As needed? But I'm always needed. The guard never ceases their duties. How am I supposed to maintain a steady workload if I rely on this temporary aid? Well, first, you need to try a low... At what time of day do I take this sildenafil? Well, on the days you use it, and only on that day, you can take it up to four hours before any stimulation, but it's best 30 minutes before. And what of my diet? Oh, don't, don't eat. You, you need an empty stomach, but you can drink water. Actually, it's a good idea to stay hydrated anyway. And what if I need to increase my output? How many of these can I take? Just one a day, but... And will this also affect my breathing if I am too vigorous? Actually, for pulmonary hypertension... And what if I am injured? If this affects my blood, will I suffer mortal wounds easier? I wouldn't recommend... Plus, I don't recover as well as I used to. If I take anything else, will it affect those things as well? I, I thought you didn't care about side... How long do I take this if I feel like my body is catching up to my head? Sometimes I get this throbbing stop, that just... Stop, 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 stop. <sighs> Look, stop with the innuendo, all right? You're talking about a sensitive topic, but you got through it. It's not easy to penetrate your defenses, but I've kept a stiff up your lift for too long. You're not going deep enough to get to the psychological basis of all this. I can't last much longer. We need to start talking in plain language or this whole encounter ends in a meaningless discharge. Do I make myself clear? Sir, yes, sir. Good. Now, as I was trying to say before you unloaded all your emotional content, erectile dysfunction is... Excuse me? Come again? What are you on about? I've been pouring my soul out about my decline as a defender of the Empire, and you wish to talk about sexual matters? What is wrong with you? I... Uh, I... Thought. You are a disgrace to your profession. And to think I let myself believe that I needed your kind of help. I have tested the limits of existence, and you have some perverse motive to corrupt everything I stand for. How dare you, sir? But, but the. And your cadence, your, your tone, the, the, the embarrassment. <sighs> you know what? I'm willing to cut my losses. I apologize for the misunderstanding. I can refer you to another clinician and we'll wipe the slate clean. Shake on it. You drive a hard bargain. Ow! Where did that come from? My grip. That's the grip I knew that could choke out the sun. You did it. I don't know how, but 
I'm back to me. I can trust my head as well as my body with my hands. I'm so excited I could just explode. Thank you. The Empire thanks you. The universe will shower you with joy. Yes! I need a vacation. Well, it really seems like he had a lot to unload there. Yeah, yeah, I I get it. Wow, wow. You know, sometimes... He was just shooting from the hip there, huh? Yeah, and unfortunately, sometimes it just gets you right between the eyes. Yep, yep. <laughs> I tried, I tried. I was like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out these innuendos, but I'm not going to... I'm not going to break. Nope, not going to crack. Yeah. I'm I'm glad. And that was all you, by the way. That yes, I just want to let everybody yes. know. This this was one of the rare instances where a comedic skit was entirely Doc's idea. He texted me and he's like, this is the plan. I have an idea for the skit. And I said, go with it. Yeah. Because, and it, as as he was typing on the Google Doc, I'm reading everything. And then he gets done and he goes, all right, that's it. I'm spent. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and I was just like, okay then, sir. Uh, you know, sometimes oh, you just, you just got to get those, uh, those creative juices flowing. Yep. And they'll just, they land where they land. Yep. 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 Felt okay. so good. I need a cigarette and a shower. So recommended reading is War of Kings, although I would recommend the whole cosmic storyline that whole era of Marvel, that that cosmic stuff, that Abnett and Lanning, mid to late 2000s stuff, Annihilation, Annihilation Conquest, Nova, Guardians of the Galaxy, War of Kings, Realm of Kings, everything coming out of all of that cosmic stuff. Gladiator is in and out as the Shi'ar Empire has various roles to play, but War of Kings in particular, he's got a very big role in that. And that really does set the stage for a lot of the subsequent storylines. War of Kings is what sets up the Guardians of the Galaxy team as we know it. Or maybe it was Annihilation Conquest. I'm, I've read a lot of that stuff kind of back to back to back. Mm-hmm. I don't remember exactly where it is, but Star-Lord, Groot, Rocket, Drax, Gamora, that whole crew that we now see in the movies, that was created as a result of all of this cosmic stuff, Annihilation and War of Kings, et cetera, et cetera. So go check that out if you have Marvel Unlimited. It's all on there. You can even read the events. You can go by the events. You can just read War of Kings and it will give you the whole reading order of the main series plus the tie-ins, the whole shebang. The way they set it up for you is beautiful. Are you listening? Are you taking notes, DC? Because your app sucks in comparison. I'm just going to say it flat out. It's like DC is like, here, we gave you comics. That's that's fine. What, you want to read something before 1985? No, no, you don't. No, you don't. No, frankly, it's more like you want to read anything before the new 52? No, you don't. No, you don't. But I digress. So upcoming episodes, Raven and Aquaman. And then we are going to take our holiday hiatus. But we have got some good stuff planned for you coming back in January. And we'll have more announcements on that at the Aquaman episode. So as always, you can find all of our episodes on our website, capesonthecouch.com. We are also a proud member of the Gunna Geek Network. And you can find us and other fantastic geeky shows at gunnageeknetwork.com. Hopefully by January, when we come back, we will be live streaming on the geeks.live website. But uh, for now, you can check us out on our YouTube channel. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Capes on the Couch. You can email us at capesonthecouch at gmail.com. And if you really like what you hear and you want to get additional content, you can go to patreon.com slash capes on the couch and subscribe to unlock early access, additional material, uncensored stuff, the whole shebang. And as I said at the top of the show, if you join our Patreon before December 18th, which is when my Extra Life streaming fundraiser will be happening, if you subscribe to our Patreon, I will take your subscription level and quintuple it and add it to the donation levels because all the money is going towards children's specialized hospitals in New Jersey. So we'll have all links to all of this in the show notes. Fantastic organization, as I said at the beginning. So all of that being said, Doc. Okay, let's be real about this. We give you a great opportunity to learn about the history of a character. We dive into certain issues the character has. We go ahead and introduce you to psychological terminology. In addition to just talking about basic life stuff that might be beneficial, we give you significant creative things that can range from the 
sublime to the ridiculous. Are you not entertained? I saw where that was going about five seconds into your rant. I was like, I know how he's going to end this. And I can't argue with that. My wife will just quote that movie at random. That whole monologue. Anyway, go be like Russell Crowe and fight around the world. Come on, Tugger. <laughs> for Doc Issues, I'm Anthony Sitko. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there.